Hey guys, so in class we wrapped up our discussion of the actual war. This video is going to be an explanation of the important things that happen after the fighting stops in World War I. Because I'm recording the video, you can pause and go back if you miss anything I say. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson called World War I the war to end all wars. But now we know that's not true. Why not? Did these post-war conferences and treaties have anything to do with that? Remember that fighting ends in World War I in 1918. We call that Armistice Day. Today we celebrate it in the U.S. as Veterans Day. It's November 11th, 1918. But just because the fighting stops doesn't mean that everything is taken care of. Now that Germany and Austria-Hungary have surrendered, both countries are very unstable and have a lot of social and political chaos that needs to be solved. The solution is to hold an international peace conference to create a formal end to World War I. It's basically a really important six month long meeting with all the major leaders of the world. Some people say that during this meeting, the world was basically run by one world government because so many leaders and decisions were happening in Paris. So who's all there? There's 32 countries in attendance, but all the decisions have to go through what we call the Big Four. David Lloyd George of Great Britain, George Clemenceau of France, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, and Woodrow Wilson of America. So what are the goals of the Paris Peace Conference? There are two major goals we're going to talk about. The first is to establish peace treaties with the losing nations. And the second is to prevent world war from ever happening again. The problem is that these negotiations are complicated. All the countries agree that Germany should be held responsible for the war, war but the big four have different priorities for what they want to get out of the peace conference. Let's talk about what France is looking to gain from the conference. France was devastated after World War I. They lost more men than any of the big four countries, and because much of the fighting happened in France, their country was war-torn. They want their country to be rebuilt, and they want Germany to pay for it. Also, they don't want Germany to ever be a military threat in Europe again. It's safe to say that France favors a harsh approach. Great Britain was much more flexible with their demands. They didn't have nearly as much physical damage as France because they were separated from Germany by water. But the British lost a lot of men, and they felt that Germany needed to be held accountable in some way. However, Lloyd George felt that restoring Germany's economy might help all of Europe recover, and Germany could help make Europe stable again. Italy comes to the conference with the expectation that it would receive the land of the now-defeated Austria-Hungarian Empire. But they're not crazy for thinking this. The Allies promised it to them when they agreed to enter the war in 1915. But now, Wilson and the rest of the Big Four are disputing the claims to that land. Needless to say, Italy is not very happy about this. And finally... America! Just kidding, guys. We all know America was not the star of World War I. But Woodrow Wilson might have been one of the most important people at the Paris Peace Conference. Early in 1918, he came up with this plan called the 14 Points that was meant to help peace negotiations and end World War I. Among these points were ideas like self-determination, which is just the idea that a country should be able to decide for itself who rules it. Another point was called Open Covenants of Peace. You know that a covenant is an agreement. This basically meant that secret alliances and treaties should not be allowed. Wilson really believed that this was a huge cause of World War I. He wasn't wrong. Unlike Britain and France, Wilson wasn't really that concerned with blaming Germany for the war. He didn't see Germany as the only cause of the war. Wilson's main concern was creating something called the League of Nations. The League of Nations was meant to be a group of countries who would help stop conflict and regulate peace in the world. 
The goal was to prevent another world war from happening, but it wasn't very successful. So one of the major reasons the League of Nations failed is because many of the countries it was designed to help weren't in it. These are major countries involved in World War I, like Russia, Germany, and even the United States. Russia was involved in its own civil war. They wouldn't let Germany in. And the United States couldn't get approval from Congress, even though Woodrow Wilson really wanted to be in it. Another problem was the League of Nations was kind of like today's UN. It was designed to work for the common good. Yet the countries who were involved in it weren't looking out for the common interests. Oftentimes they would do things selfishly and they would only um, make decisions that were best for their country and not best for the country they were supposed to be protecting. Finally, the League of Nations was disbanded in 1936 because it was deemed ineffective at preventing world war. Okay, hopefully you're starting to see now why all of these people might disagree. Wilson was called an idealist because he was always pushing for what the ideal solution would be to a conflict. Clemenceau and Lloyd George were realists. They were more concerned with what was really possible. France, Britain, and Italy also had a different perspective than the United States because they were directly involved in the alliances that led to the war, while the U.S. was isolated. However, the Big Four were anxious to get the treaties set up. They didn't want Germany to go into total chaos and end up like unstable Russia. France and Britain end up getting their way for most of the treaty. So let's get into the meat of the Treaty of Versailles. There were five treaties signed with the losing countries of World War I. But the one that's most important is the Treaty of Versailles because it's with Germany. It's also the harshest of all the treaties. There are four parts that we're going to talk about about the Treaty of Versailles. And the first is called the War Guilt Clause. This requires that Germany take full responsibility for World War I. The second is that Germany is required to disarm. This means that it can no longer have a standing army, navy, or air force. Also, France is now allowed to hold troops in some parts of Germany. The third part requires Germany to give up its world colonies and other land. That means that France and Britain and other countries get to take hold of German colonies throughout the world. And the final, and maybe the most well-known, is that Germany has to pay reparations for its role in causing World War I. This means that it has to pay back the cost of the damages to other countries. The amount that Germany had to pay back is equivalent to $442 billion in U.S. dollars today. This is devastating to the German economy, and it makes the German people very angry. It almost fosters a vengeance that sets the stage for World War II. Germany is forced to accept the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Alright, so you made it to the end of the video. Seems like you made it alive. I know you had to listen to me talk for about nine minutes, um, but everything that we do now for World War I is a lot more exciting, so stay tuned.